Turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Um, I have um, a number of different sermons that I preach in a variety of places. They're, they're usually sermons that people ask me or either subjects they ask me to speak on or sermons that people have heard me preach that they ask me to repeat in certain occasions. And uh, this is a sermon that I wrote a number of years ago for some, some different reasons, reasons that aren't nearly important right now. And it has come full circle in this, in this COVID crisis, pandemic, global pandemic that we're living in. And I think the unrest that we have um, uh, in general in, in the world and particularly um, what we're seeing happen even in the United States. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that, that every political problem is a spiritual crisis. I don't want to imply that. But I, I do think there's a reality that there is a, at least there's unfavorable winds beginning to blow against religious liberty and uh, of necessity. I think that's gonna, it's going to begin to attack Christian institutions. Now, truthfully, I think the church will be largely, um, largely immune to it, at least at the beginning, institutions like educational institutions which we have, are, are more likely to be in the line of fire. And I don't say that to be an alarmist. I just say that to say that we, we need to live soberly. We need to live with our eyes wide open. We need to understand uh, the times that we're living in. And uh, so tonight I want to speak on this subject. It, it, it both is very pertinent for the hour, and I think it's also one of those truths that, that if you get it, if you understand this principle, it prepares you to deal with whatever life throws at you. I want to speak on this subject, how to build an unshakable life. How to build an unshakable life. Several years ago, <clears throat> by the way, my children are 37, 30, I have to do this math in my mind, so give me, I used to be able to do it really fast, but it takes me a minute. They're 37, 34, 32, and 19. That's not funny, it's just true. And when my 19-year-old was about 10, our church gave me a trip. They, they, they wanted me to go on a cruise anywhere in the world. I'd already been to Hawaii never been to Alaska. They, they asked us, they gave us a, a 30-day sabbatical. They paid for us to be gone for 30 days, and part of that was a 12-day a, a cruise into Alaska. He said, it may be a reward for you, it's punishment for me. <laughs> like what 11-year-old wants to go hang out for 30 days with his parents, Right. No friends, just his parents for 30 days. About the most interesting thing that happened <clears throat> on that trip was we got to this place in Alaska where they talked about an earthquake that originated in Alaska in 1964. I would have been five years old at the time. Some of you would remember this. It was the most powerful earthquake to ever hit North America. It had such force at that earthquake, now think about this, that water in lakes in Texas sloshed four to five feet just from the, the, the seismic shift of land. It was an earthquake that moved, visually moved the space needle, almost unheard of. It completely ravished the coast of Alaska because of the tsunamis that came out of the ocean waters. You wouldn't have to be alive then, but you could have lived through an earthquake to understand this, that there are times when the earth shakes. There's nothing quite as unsettling as when the ground underneath you is shaking. We, we intuitively know this. Like we know that 
that thunder and lightning is a product of the weather, but there's something about the noise of thunder that tells us it's somehow connected to the judgment of God. It's the same thing about when the earth shakes underneath you. We know that the earth is groaning. Romans teaches us that. We know that earthquakes are a sign of God's coming judgment. In fact, Isaiah 13, Haggai chapter 2 and verse number 8 tell us that in the last days, the earth is going to be shaken by God in judgment. The judgment of the nations, the earth, is going to shake. If you remember the story of Isaiah, when he went into the temple, Isaiah chapter 6, in the year when King Uzziah died, what happened when Isaiah went into the temple and he saw the Lord high and lifted up? Do you remember? And the earth shook in the temple, a sign of, of, of the weight of, of God's holiness could not keep the earth still, the weight of God's justice coming down. There's a place in the book of Acts. It's in Acts chapter 4 where the disciples, interestingly, in a time of persecution, right? They're they're being persecuted by the religious and political leaders in Israel, and they're forbidden from speaking the name of Jesus. And they go into the upper room, you remember? And they they enter into an all-night prayer meeting, and while they are praying, here's what the Bible says in Acts 4 and verse 31 and 32, and when they prayed, the room, the earth was shaken, and the Spirit of God came flooding into that room. It was a sign of God's presence for the disciples, and it was an indication of of God's judgment for those that were opposing him. So here's the truth. You're either going to be shaken by what's happening in the world around you, or God's going to shake you. Those are the only choices. In other words, the more that God shakes you, the more that you're shaken by God, the less that the things that happen in the world are going to shake you. Either you're going to be so shaken by God that nothing shakes you, or if God never shakes you, everything else in the world will shake you. The passage that we look at tonight is the climax to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is actually a sermon. It's not a letter. There's no introduction to the letter. There's no greeting to the letter. It's just a sermon. And by the way, It's a long sermon, probably considerably longer than the sermon I'm going to preach to you tonight. And it's a sermon that is written to these people, these Hebrew people, these followers of Jesus who had been scattered about because of the persecution that had come because they had abandoned cultural religion in Judaism and had become devout followers of Jesus Christ. And they were facing some incredible, brutal realities. The writer of the book of Hebrews is writing to them to try to comfort them, to try to help them to live with poise and grace so they would not completely melt down and fall apart at the incredible difficulties and persecutions that they were facing. It is possible, according to what Scripture teaches us and what this passage will show us tonight that you can stand with poise and grace, that you can live in a way that you appear to be completely unaffected by what is going on all around you when the world is coming apart at the seams. In fact, that's what the writer does here. He's going to show us that you can build your life on something that will get you through every setback. He was going to show us that these difficulties do not have to overwhelm you. That you won't be shaken. That you can stand with confidence when your world is coming apart through sickness, through death, through failure of relationship, through loss of career, and even through uncertain 
world conditions. You see, you either build a life that is uncertain, or you're going to build on a, a life on God that cannot be shaken. You're actually doing that. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm telling you, you're either building a life that will not be shaken, or you're building a life that is going to absolutely come apart when the pressure comes. And I'm, I'm going to show you tonight in this passage how you build an unshakable life. Let me just read a couple verses for you to get us into the passage, and then we'll work through it verse by verse. Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you are not come unto the mount, now think that's Mount Sinai, that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Now this is a a reference to the children of Israel in Exodus 19 and Exodus 20 when they've surrounded the base of Mount Sinai and Moses is going up the mountain and he's hearing the voice of God, the finger of God is touching the stones and the judgment of God has come. Literally, this is the fire on the mountain. This is thunder on the mountain. This is God dealing with the children of Israel. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or thrust through with the dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. That's what Moses said. Here's what the children of Israel said. You can look it up, but it's in, in the book of Exodus. They said to Moses, let not God speak with us lest we die. This is such a fearful thing, Moses. You go up to the mountain you go into the face of God, you hear the voice of God, you come down and tell us what God said, but don't make us go up there and face God. We can't do it. It's pretty serious. Verse 22, but you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See then that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for, he, for, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall, ye not, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. There's got to be some things in your life that cannot be shaken. Verse number 28, for wherefore we receive we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Let me do this quickly for you. Let's talk about the need for an unshakable life. As you begin the passage here, and you look at this description of the judgment of God, this account of the children of Israel standing at the base of the mountain and not wanting God to speak with them is really an incredible story filled with insight. As the children of Israel gather at the foot of the mountain to hear the commands, there's thunder, there's lightning, there's smoke on the mountain, there's the sound of the trumpet, which is the voice of God. And the people then say to Moses, let, God not, let not God speak with us lest we die. That means that they're literally hearing the word of God and standing before God and before his word and they're trembling, literally they're shaking in their sandals. You say, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that because they they come to this realization that there is something so powerful and so unique and so great and so holy about God that they have no basis to approach God and to stand in his presence at all. That's important. 
See, the truth of the matter is we live such really small lives, such insignificant lives, that, that we wonder why we're fearful, why we're anxious, why we get so angry, why we respond so, so horrifically to, to a little bit of inconvenience and loss in our life. It's because we're building our life on things that if we lose those things, we think our life comes apart. And what we, what we fail to realize is that if we build our life on God, if, our, if we have standing with God, then it really doesn't matter what happens about anything else in our life, that relationship with God will get us through. What this passage then is teaching us about the need for an unshakable life is really an unshakable life is when you possess boldness to approach God by his grace. That is that you have confidence that you know that you have an access into the presence of God and that everything in your life is going to be held together, not because the things in your life will hold you together, but because God can hold your life together. But when you come into God's presence without grace and you stand before God on your own, you're like the children of Israel. They thought if they did well enough, if they lived morally, if they were born into the right family, if they treated other people better than they were treated, that that would give them the basis and the right to have standing before God. It sounds good, doesn't it? And in their case, actually, here's what they were thinking. Hey, God, remember how bad we had it in Egypt? And God, if you're a God of justice, if you're a God that equalizes things out, we had it so bad for so long that truly, God, you have to make up for that kind of things, right? You do tip the scales in our favor, and you owe us some things because we suffered so much. And then they come to the mountain. And when they come to the mountain, they realize, hey, God doesn't owe us anything. And these ideas about our own righteousness really don't hold up. And it's a warning to each of us that you better be sure that whatever it is that you're building your life upon can hold up when God begins to shake the world in judgment. See, if you're building your life on money, what are you going to do? Throw a suitcase full of 20s in the face of God and say, hey God, this should get me through whatever I'm going through. Or if you built your life on a career, what are you going to do? Give God your resume and and three or four references? If you're building your life on having a perfect family, how are you going to hide the black sheep of the family? What are you building your life on? That leads us to this thought, an unshakable life is when your relationship with God is based on a reality that can withstand all that life can throw at you. See, you have this contrast. In verse number 18, he says, for you are not come unto the mount that might be touched. And then he comes down into verse 22 and he says, but you or come unto Mount Zion, unto the heavenly city. In other words, the way the children of Israel approach God is not the way that you have to approach God. And the difference is this. Jesus Christ went to God on your behalf. So you don't have to approach Christ based, approach God based on what you have done, but you can approach Christ on, or you can approach God on the basis of what Jesus has done for you. You see, In your life, you have something you think is making life work for you. It could be money, it could be accomplishment, it could be career, it could be relationships, it could be your parents, it could be your family, and you're coming to God with that thing at the center of your life, and you're hoping and believing that that gives you standing, and that gives you stability, and then what happens is the earth begins to shake, and God begins to judge. And things begin to fall apart. They do, right? They always come apart. Isn't that the second law of thermodynamics? That eventually, everything comes apart. Your life is coming apart. Can I tell you something? I turned, I turned 61 on Monday. Your body comes apart. Isn't that true? Doesn't that happen? 
And you've got to build your life on something that is not going to come apart in, in the 1700s. There was a great move, a worldwide great awakening. The great awakening of the 1700s was, was really the culmination or, or the synergistic move of several unique moves of God. The Moravian missions movement was a part of that. The, the, the Wesleys and the Methodist movement was a part of that. The worldwide preaching and revival preaching of, of um, George Whitfield was a part of that. Probably no human personality had more to do with the Great Awakening than Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is considered to be probably um, the greatest of all American thinkers, greatest of all American minds. He was not perfect by any stretch. Nobody, Nobody would argue that he was. Edwards began to preach about experience with God. Not, not emotionalism, but a profound conversion, transformation, encounter with God that would absolutely change your life. And Edwards began to define it this way, that a religious person comes to God because he finds God to be useful. And what Edwards was pointing out was simply this, right, that if we are good enough, then God owes us enough and God's going to give us things and we're going to build our life on the things that God gives us because we're good people. And Ezra's point was, that only works until the fire begins to fall, right? That only works until the judgment begins to come. So while a moral or religious person comes to God because he finds him useful, A Christian comes to God because he finds him to be beautiful. Not because he can get from God something, but because he finds in God the one thing that is missing from his life. And by the way, didn't Edwards preach the most famous sermon of the Great Awakening on this very text that I read to you tonight, Sinner's in the hands of an angry God. And what was he saying? That there's going to come a time when the world is going to shake you and you better be unutterably unshakable by God or your life is going to come apart. That's the need for an unshakable life. Number two, you have the signs of an unshakable life. So some of you are probably thinking, well, boy, I really want an unshakable life. A few years ago, I found out I had cancer. <clears throat> it was a little bit of a surprise. I, I think I alluded to this last time I was here. And probably the most difficult part outside of telling my kids and working through that issue with them was having to tell our church. And what made it difficult was all that I had done pastorally for at that point, 27 years, they felt a great need to try to, to try to return that towards me. And, and it's humbling, and it was, it, it was, it was overwhelming for people to show you. And, and I began to feel not, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but I began to feel the pressure to, to, to live up to and live out everything I'd preached to them for 26 years. And I finally had to say to them, I said, I don't want you to pity me. I don't want you to pity me, not because I'm a stoic. I don't want you to pity me, not because I'm uncaring or unfeeling. I don't want you to pity me because I don't need to be pitied. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, if everything I've preached to you is true, then my, my life, my outlook, my joy, my happiness, my faith, my confidence is not one bit different today knowing that I have cancer than it was yesterday when I didn't know I had cancer. Doesn't change anything. 
Now, I, di- I didn't say that and, and secretly Tony was like, like, I hope God that's really true because it would be bad if it wasn't. I said that because I really believed that and not just believed it, I was experiencing that. My, my kids said, and, and you have to understand, I'm very close to my kids, but my kids said, Dad, how are we going to get through this? I said, we're going to get through this the same exact way that I have told people for 26 years that you get through things in your life. You're going to trust God. I said, you know what? The worst thing that would ever happen to me is the best thing that will ever happen to me. Is that true? Amen. See, you have to have you have to have an unshakable life. You say, well, how do you know it? He shows us here in this passage of scripture. Let me me show you here. When he says in verse 22, you are come, he's suggesting that the basis for you to approach God is contrasted with those that came first to Mount um, Sinai. See, when you come to God on his terms, and not on your terms. In other words, if you don't make conditions to come to God, but you come to God just on God's terms, then you have a confidence. You have a joy. You have a hope that can never be taken from you. Here's a sign of an unshakable life. You have a future that cannot be shaken. He talks about the city. It's really interesting. If you've ever been to Israel, you, you, you can see this plainly. You know, God does his greatest work in the Bible on mountains. Just sometime think through the mountain peaks of Scripture, what God does on, on Oreb and on Sinai and on Mount Moriah, right? Mount Moriah is a place where Abraham offered up Isaac. Mount Moriah is the place, it is... It is Temple Mount in Jerusalem today. It is where God put the temple. That's where the sacrifice was made that, that, um, that was offered on the altar. But God oftentimes not only does his greatest work on mountains, he talks about cities, right? And so there's a city, Jerusalem, and then there's this city of Zion, this living city of Zion. And so when he says in verse 22, Mount Zion under the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem, he's now saying, hey, get your eyes off earth for a moment and realize I'm not talking about the earthly Jerusalem. I'm talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. Because actually there's a city of God and a city of man. The city of man in present society is based on the principle that you build a name for yourself and you build that name on the basis of what you accomplish, what you acquire, what you do, and you do that at the expense of others. But that's the city of man. There's actually a heavenly city that's going to come down, the new heaven and the new earth, the city of Zion, and that city is a complete different society. It is built on a completely different city, and in the city to come, in the future city, in the heavenly city, it's not your life for mine, right? I don't get at your expense. It is actually my life for you. That's what Jesus did for us. See, Jesus is talking about, or the writer of the book of Hebrews is talking about the city that is talked about in the book of Revelation, the city four square, the city that is coming down from heaven. And he says, present tense, you have come to that city. Now, now wait a minute, you got to get what he's driving at here. Past tense, Mount Sinai, you weren't there. You can only read about it in the book of Exodus. Verse 22, but you are now in present future sense. You are coming in the present to experience the future reality that is going to be yours in heaven. Now, this is really interesting. You begin to experience the future life that you have in eternity the very moment that you come to God on his terms, not on your own. God gives you something. He gives you a unique and a different kind of life. 
I, we say this all the time. We, we, we say this is a regular part of inviting people to faith in Jesus Christ. Coming to Jesus does not solve all your problems. Now, if you've come tonight and you say, I can't wait, I, I, I need to be saved, I'm not a Christian, I need to be and I want to be, and I'm going to come to Jesus and all my problems are going to be solved, let me tell you something, don't come expecting all your problems to be solved. In fact, let me tell you something, if you come to Jesus, you're going to get a whole new set of problems. But you're also going to get this, you're going to get a new power and a new way to deal with those problems. And he'll give you a poise and a grace that you never had before. And you'll immediately begin to experience the future reality of the coming kingdom of God. And it is going to come into your life with such force and such violence and, and such power that your life will never, ever be the same. You experience a future. And that future can never, ever be taken away from you. You see, you have this hope. You have this knowledge that your life does not end. It's not worse in the future than the present. In fact, if for the Christian living in the city of God on earth is a foretaste of a heavenly future where everything in your life is miraculously going to be better than it is right now. So here's the sign of an unshakable life. You have a future that cannot be shaken. You also have a joy that cannot be shaken. So listen to this. You're come unto Mount Sinai, Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And then you have this expression, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Underline that expression, to an innumerable company of angels. Do you remember where in the book of Luke, famously there's the, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and then the parable of the lost son, right? Do you, do you remember that? The woman loses the coin, she searches the house. The shepherd one sheep is gone and he leaves the 90 and 9 and goes to find the one lost sheep, right? And then the parable of the prodigal son, you've got the two sons, the older son, the righteous moral son stays home and the prodigal goes off into a far country and the father waits for the prodigal son to come home. You remember those stories? And do you remember that in the first two, there's those famous verses where there's joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that repents? right? And then in the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal, it doesn't quote that verse, but it says that there's a party, right? There's a feast, the fatted calf. There's merrymaking, and, right? And dancing and singing because the son has come home. Now, people say this. Do, do, you, know that, do you know that preachers sometimes say really dumb things? No, you, I mean, you can admit it, right? They do, right? I mean, not your pastor, but preachers do. Have you ever heard a pastor say that? I'm not, don't call out who it is. I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to be critical. You, you ever heard a, that, that the angels rejoice when people get saved? You ever heard somebody say that? Sure. That's not true. That is not true. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that. Not, not one place. It says that there's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. The angels aren't happy. In fact, we actually know from Peter's writing that the angels are, are looking over and they're watching all of this happening and they're searching diligently, and they're inquiring, trying to wrap their mind around what is happening, why God is so redemptive and forgiving and gracious towards sinners that repent. We actually have that picture, right? On the, on the mercy seat, the cherubims, the angels are staring intently, their wings spread and their heads bowed, looking into the mercy seat, because they don't understand it. 
say, well, then who's happy in heaven? It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. They're in a cosmic celebration. They are high-fiving one another. And they are evolving in what C.S. Lewis calls the eternal dance. And they're moving in such harmony, making a way for sinners to be invited into the dance that takes place with the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And there's this incredible, eternal, everlasting joy that never ends in the presence of God. Amen. Can I tell you what you're heading into? You are, if you don't like fun, and if you are not happy, and you don't like happy people, you are in big trouble when you get to heaven. Because it is a cosmic, eternal joyful celebration of God's redeeming love for us. You get that? So you have a future that cannot be shaken. You have a joy that cannot be shaken. And then you have an identity that cannot be shaken. Look what he says. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Here's what's at the heart of that joy. You have a name written in heaven. You're part of the church of the firstborn. In fact, a lot of the book of Hebrews is about that. That Jesus is the elder brother is actually literally going to sing over you. He's not going to be ashamed. Listen, there's there's a scene in in the future, in in the future of glory, where Jesus, the, the Lamb of God, comes down off the throne and stands in the midst of the sea of this, this, this innumerable company of sinners that have come to faith in Jesus. And Jesus leaves the throne of God and he comes down into the midst of, of people and he looks back at the throne and he begins to sing over the top of all of the people that have been saved. And he sings to the Father that he's not ashamed to call us brethren. Now, you don't think that would be a moving moment? When you think about all the things that you have done that would have caused any normal human being to reject you, to turn their back on you, to deny you, and Jesus is going to confess by singing to the Father that he's not ashamed to call his brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. There was a time when Jesus sent out the disciples. You can read this. It's in Luke chapter 10. And he sends them out and he tells them to go house to house and to look for places where they would be received, where they'd find a man of peace and they would share the gospel. And if they met opposition, they were to take the shoes off their feet and clap the sandals, right, to to remove the dust from their feet and to go on. And they come back from this this 70-person journey, two by two, and they return to Jesus and and they say to him, they're rejoicing when they come back and they're, they're telling him that, you know, that the, 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 the lame were healed and the, the, the sick were raised up and, and the, even the demons were subject unto them. Think about that for a moment. In the power of God's name, they raised people from the dead, they healed sick people, and they cast out demons. And Jesus looks at him and he says notwithstanding, and this rejoice not. Now, what's Jesus saying? He said, don't get all excited that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Now, what is Jesus driving at? Here's what he's saying. Look, I sent you out on mission. And you did some incredible things. And you came back and you told me that even the demons are subject unto you. But what happens the next time you go out and it doesn't work? Right? Tony, what happens on the Sunday you don't preach great sermons? Or people don't get saved? Or people leave the church? Right? Or people reject the message? 
So do we rejoice only because it works? Or do we rejoice in this? That our names are written in heaven and nothing can take us out of that relationship with God. Yeah. Right? He's saying that a sign of an unshakable life is simply this, that you have a future that cannot be taken away from you. You have a joy that will never subside and you have an identity that you'll never lose. That's an unshakable life. You can get through anything. You say, well, how do you get it? Well, look at verse 25. See then that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. Who speaks from heaven? Jesus, verse 24, the mediator of the new covenant to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than Abel. His voice then shook the earth. Say, so what's that mean? Well, <clears throat> when you think about what he's driving at here is he's talking about what causes the earth to shake you see he's beginning to tell us that there's something about Jesus and this judgment that we've got to begin to sort out and understand and Jesus actually talks about that right is he going to come to judge the earth and we, we're reminded that Jesus did not come to bring judgment, Jesus came to bear judgment. You better understand that he came to bear judgment before you can understand that he comes to bring judgment. There's a place in Matthew 27, verses 50 to 52, and then a place in Matthew 28 where there are two literal earthquakes. The first, Matthew 27, is when Jesus died on the cross. That was the earthquake that was associated with the justice of God. What happened is the weight of God's judgment, the weight of God's righteousness was so great that when Jesus died, it came down in power on earth. It was symbolic, and yet it couldn't help but happening. It was the justice of God coming down on our sin and it so came forcefully that the earth could not stop shaking. And by the way, I say this to you and I say this lovingly and kindly that the weight of God's justice and judgment will come down on your sin. It won't come down just on the world only. It will come down on your life and it will come apart. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. In Matthew 28, there was a different earthquake. In Matthew 28, it was the earthquake that is associated with the resurrection of Jesus. There, it wasn't the weight of God's justice coming down. It was the weight of the righteousness of God coming down. So just as the as the justice of God created an earthquake because it was stronger than the earth, now the righteousness of Jesus creates not just an earthquake, but a death quake because the righteousness of Jesus is stronger than death. you got to wrap your mind around this. Now stay with me. I'm almost done. Don't lose me here. Don't, don't tune me out. So... There's such great theology in the Chronicles of Narnia. Have you ever read the books or seen the movie? Do you, do you remember in the Chronicles of Narnia where, where Lewis in writing says there's a deep magic from before the dawn of time? Now, now this is Lewis writing, right? And he, he comes out of Narnia and he says, Jesus Christ, by dying in our place, by paying, by taking the earthquake of justice on himself, because Jesus was willing to be shaken utterly, by him being shaken, he broke death. He broke it. He took death by the throat and he shook it. So you see the death 
of death in the death of Jesus. Do you get that? Say, what happened when Jesus rose from the dead? Jesus killed death. He took the sting from death. You see, Jesus is saying, I was shaken utterly so that you could be utterly unshakable. Or you could say it this way, I was shaken to pieces so that you would not have to be. Do you get that? You see, if you see that, if you see Jesus on the cross being so shaken by God, not because of what he did, but because of what we did. Do you see it? And when you see it, you know he loves you. Right? That's how you know. Remember when God said to Abraham, now I know that you love me, for you did not withhold your only son whom you love from me. Do you remember that on Mount Moriah? Now we can look at Calvary. We can look at the Mount Moriah of the New Testament. We can look at Mount Calvary and we can say, God, now we know that you love us because you are willing to shake him to pieces. How horrifying it was in that moment for Jesus to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It, it, it was not the physical pain of death that shook Jesus. It was that what felt like an eternity of separation from the Father when the Father turned his back on the Son and the Son stepped out of the dance and he stepped out of the joy and he stepped out of the relationship and bore the weight of the judgment of God that we deserve to experience. And he did it. He paid the debt so we wouldn't have to. He paid the debt so that we could come to the mountain and we could look at the law of God and say, if I'm not perfect, there's still a way for me. We can look at the justice and the judgment of God and say, it will never touch me. We can look at the holiness of God and say it is a free gift that God has given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, when you understand that the meaning of the earthquakes in Matthew 27 and 28, then nothing in this earth or nothing on this earth will shake you. Let me tell you something. We hope the world is going to stop shaking, but it won't. It just won't. You see, you and I know many people today that are shaking. There are realities in their life, either known by others or known only to themselves, that are causing them to shake. And you can be sure if, they're, if you're going to make it, if you're going to build a life that is going to endure and you're standing before God, then you can handle anything. But if you don't, the world is going to shake you. The more that God shakes you, the less the world will shake you. The less that God shakes you, the more the world is going to shake you. This is a test. Do you get it? It's a test. The more that you surrender to God, the more you give up everything for Him, the more that you let Him take first place in your life, the less the things that are in the world are going to shake your life. And you can begin to live out this truth and this reality where it says here, yet once more, the removing of those things that are shaken as of the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. See, it is a test, right? You're going to be shaken. So you can find out if you have something in your life that is utterly unshakable.